Um, the only thing I want to draw our attention to is that our service will end in silence tonight. We will not be excused. Um, we, will, we will depart in silence after the altar. Um, all the items have been removed from the altar. Um, and I will make sure to exit so that you, you know and feel comfortable. But just wanted to let you know that so that you're prepared for that. Um, we're just happy to have you all with us tonight as we enter the great three days that lead up to Easter, with Monday, Thursday being the first, Good Friday being the second, and we don't observe the Easter vigil, but the Holy, Holy Saturday is our third day of the great three days. So welcome to Monday, Thursday. Please rise as you are able for the call to worship. On the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus stays with his friends. On the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus said, The bread and the wine are my body and my blood, given for you. On the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus stirred the Lord of the Lord on the last night. On the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus transformed the bread, wine, and water Friends in Christ, in this Lenten season, we have heard our Lord's call, call to struggle against sin, death, and the devil, all that keeps us from loving God and each other. This is the struggle to which we are called in baptism. Within the community of the church, God never wearies of forgiving sin and giving the peace of reconciliation. On this night, let us confess our sin against God and our neighbor and enter the celebration of the great three days reconciled with God and one another. We'll take a moment of silence before we continue. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, mercy loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ your sins are forgiven. Almighty God strengthen you with the power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Amen.
For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly, no, very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And as I said to the Judeans, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, Everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. Please sing. <coughs> Beloveds of God, grace and peace to you in the name of the Holy One. Amen. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus removed his outer robe, wrapped himself in a towel, and knelt to wash his disciples' feet. He knelt to wrap them in his love and care, to ready them for what was to come. He knelt to show them what he needs when he says, just as I have loved you, you should love one another. In kneeling, he defied all expectations and societal norms and once again turns everything upside down. In most households, at the very least, a servant would provide the bowl, water, and towel so that guests could wash their own feet. Exposed to the elements and living in a world where the roads were mostly packed dirt covered in animal droppings and other refuse, Having clean feet was an important part of hospitality. Other than in the poorest households, the host would never serve their guests by actually washing their feet or physically even providing the tools to do so. A servant would do it. But on the night in which he was betrayed, it was just Jesus and his disciples. There were no servants. Who could they expect to provide the water, the bowl, and the towel? Certainly not one of them, right? At this point in John's Gospel, Jesus has been firmly established as the Messiah. And even before that, he was first their teacher, their leader, and their friend. Under no circumstances would it ever be appropriate for him to do the most menial of menial tasks something that only a servant would be expected to do. Remember, they have only just entered Jerusalem for the Passover. And they were greeted by the exultant and expected masses as though Jesus were a conquering hero. Washing his disciples' feet most certainly does not meet those expectations of who the Messiah is. Can you imagine the silence in the room? As Jesus removes his outer robe, grabs the towel, the water, the basin, and kneels to wash that first person's feet. The sound of water pouring into a basin. The rustle of clothes as the disciples moved their feet. 
as Jesus wipes them dry. Twelve times over. Water pouring, clothes rustling, feet toweled dry. The disciples quiet as Jesus moves to each one of them, quiet with disbelief and shock, discomfort, the knowledge that they will not be able to refuse, no matter that Jesus should not be doing it at all. Their idea of who the Messiah is, is supposed to be is once again coming in conflict with who Jesus says that he is as the Messiah. Jesus, the Messiah, who once called Peter Satan, now washes his feet. Jesus, the Messiah, who knows that Judas will betray him, washes his feet. I imagine the care that he took in this act. The care we take when washing a beloved, often a baby or a child, an elderly family member, a loved one in need of extra support. How gentle we are with the cloth as we wipe their skin, ensure that it's dry and protected, that there's nothing scratchy or uncomfortable placed directly against the skin. We encounter Peter's reluctance first. We can also imagine that the other 11 disciples were also reluctant, but bold, brash Peter speaks up. We assume that Peter is reluctant to have Jesus wash his feet because Jesus is the Messiah, his teacher, his friend. But I wonder if there's more to his reluctance than that. Having, having one's feet washed places us in a vulnerable position. Someone else holding our feet, pouring water over them, drying them. <coughs> Someone else seeing our chipped nail polish and cracked heels, smelling our feet, glimpsing all the things we normally keep well hidden, unless it's summer and sandal season. Someone else in control of the moment. Peter's reluctance is an ancient echo to our reluctance that we share in that sort of vulnerability. Many people over the years have said to me, I will never do a foot washing. Even now, many of you are cringing at the very thought of doing it. But Jesus looks at Peter and he tells him that unless Jesus washes his feet, Peter can have no share with Jesus. I mean, it's not really about having his feet washed, but what it represents. Jesus washes his disciples' feet to help them understand the way in which we are called to love one another. A share with Jesus includes following his examples of love for each other and for all those who we meet along the way. He asks if Peter understands what, is, what it is that Jesus has done. Do we know what it is that he has done for us? If we cannot receive the simple gift of physical cleaning, how will we be able to accept the much deeper, more humbling cleansing of our sin that Jesus has given us through his humiliating death on a cross? In the salvation that Christ has accomplished, all that Jesus has done and will always do for us isn't just about the cross itself. It is about the birth and the baptism, the teaching and the healing, the body and the blood, the basin and the towel, the life and the death. On this night, we meet Jesus at his most pastoral, his most tender and loving self. He knows what tomorrow brings. He knows that his time with them is almost over. He 
He loves them to the end, not just the end of his crucifixion and his death, but with the entirety of his life, his resurrection, the whole witness of the Word made flesh. This is how we are to love one another. How we are to love others. Not just with our words, but in truth and deed. To love with compassion and care. To risk being vulnerable, even when it makes us cringe down to our very soul. To know that no one is beneath us in that care. On the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus showed us how to love and commanded us to do likewise. This is how the world knows who we are and whose we are by the way in which we love one another. Thanks be to God.
through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. Who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to death. On the third day he rose again. He ascended to heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the resting. Amen. You may be seated. With simple elements and simple acts, Jesus flipped the scripts of power to bring about new possibilities for God's love in the world. Before his betrayal and death, Jesus touched his followers and sealed their connection. Jesus taught us to wash one another's feet so that we might witness each other's goodness and be made clean. Through the waters of baptism, God claims us as God's own and marks the calling for our lives onto our bodies. Together, we will remember our baptisms. First, let us pray. God, God who poured forth the water, God, God who formed each one of us, we give you thanks for the sacrament of baptism. Allow the cool drip of water on our bodies to bring us closer to you, so that we might live in your hearts with justice, kindness, and humility. As we remember your promises to us, renew in us the heart of compassion for others, and help us recognize your presence in all who we need. Amen. We will not be doing a foot washing tonight, although I hope I've planted some seeds. But you are invited to come up and have your hands washed and blessed. You are invited at this time to do so.
trusting in Jesus, who gave his life for the world. Let us pray for the church, the world, and all who live. God, who kneels to wash our feet, gather your church around the world during this holy week. Humble us to receive your gifts of grace so that we can extend that grace to others. Make us bold in service and love to a hurting world. Merciful God, God, whose greatest commandment is love, guide all who govern by the principle of love. Free our world from conflict. Bring unity to a troubled nations and to troubled homes. Let your glorious peace reign in every heart. Merciful God. God who was betrayed, comfort people everywhere who have suffered abuse at the hands of someone they knew and trusted. Heal the bodies, minds, and hearts of all victims. Help all in pain, whether physical or mental, to know that you are near. Merciful God, God who sits at the table with us, grant the joy of your presence to people around the world celebrating their First Communion today, and to all of us who share in the meal. Strengthen the communities of faith and grace, and give courage to boldly share your promises through word and deed. Merciful God, and God who brings new life out of death, we pray with thanks for the lives of those who have joined the communion of saints. In our holy meal, connect us to the faithful who have gone before us and nourish us as your people living today. Merciful God, Receive these prayers, loving God, for the sake of the one who loved us to the end, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. I invite you to share a sign of that peace with one another.
let us pray. Holy God, you are the host of our meal tonight. Just as you turn bread and wine into our body and blood, please take our gifts and turn them into blessings for your whole church. May your holy meal fill us with your love and send us out to serve your world. We pray this in your name. Amen. I invite you to please rise as you are able as we continue with our communion liturgy. God will be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. God of all time and all creation, we thank you for your work in our world, for good food and good friends, for the time to share a bountiful meal and the space to worship you. All that we have and all that we are comes from you. Most of all, this night we thank you for Jesus Christ, for the faithful and righteous life that he lived, for the journey he made during this week that we celebrate from exalted king to crucified Lord, and for the meal that he shared with his disciples before he was killed, where he revealed and shared his full self with those who cared for him. We remember that the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took the bread, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to all to drink, saying, Take and drink. This cup is the new covenant shed in my blood for you and all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Be present with us now by the power of your spirit, that once again this meal might be a chance for us to share in the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. May this bread be for us the body of Christ, this cup be the blood of our Lord, and the sharing of this feast our participation in that meal of so long ago. Strengthen us by this meal through the journey ahead that we might continue to walk with Christ along the road of his passion and death as we await his rising on Easter into the fullness of new life. Through Christ, who shares this table with us even now, we pray. Amen. Amen. Gathered together as one, we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us to stay in our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The table is set, all is ready, all are welcome. You may be seated. <coughs> Thank you. 
to those who are worshiping with us from home, this is the body and blood of Christ given and shed for you. Amen. I invite you to please rise. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Loving God, you call us to love one another the way you love us, extravagantly and without <clears throat> reservation, even to the end. Give us courage to claim you when others betray, courage to follow you when others desert, courage to love even when we are not loved in return. You have broken yourself open to show us love and life. Help us to do the same, loving, serving, and caring for your world. We pray this in the name of your beloved Jesus Christ, 